but just diving deeper, your work is kind of diving deeper on a, on a lot of fronts. What, what was it about your life that steered you in this direction? Do you think? Well, so I was very interested in the question of what does it mean to be a human being? And, and part of, you know, I think just most sensitive people are worried about that. It's a very personal question. What, what kind of creatures are we? Why are we here? So these are sort of the, 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 the deep philosophical questions that, that occurred to people over, over many, many millennia. Um, and also I was raised in a fundamentalist Christian background um, where I get a, uh, I got a particular slant on things in a particular way of trying to understand what they, what they thought was the truth. And so there was this conflict um, when I was growing up between the sort of dogmatic um, approach that I was hearing on, on the weekends at, in church services and the, the, um, the evidence-based uh, approach to understanding that I was getting as I studied the sciences. And so that, that intrigued me. Also, the different answers I was getting about what is the meaning of life and, and, you know, and the meaning of human existence um, was very, very different from the two sides. And so I decided that I really wanted to find out for myself what, uh, you know, what I thought. Uh, but I, I realized that um, the dogmatic approach as, as an approach is not a very successful approach for actually understanding things. So I needed to really take the scientific approach to try to get an evidence-based, uh, you know, precise theory-based um, approach to this whole question. So, so I decided to set out and, and try to answer questions like, are we machines? Um, are we just machines? Is there some deeper meaning to human life? Is consciousness just an epiphenomenon of, of you know, complex machine activity? Or is consciousness something something more than that or something different from that and and I you know these are of course very very difficult problems and and so I did realize that um, it, there's a real risk if you jump in too early without lots of training there's a real risk that you'll jump in and, and pretty much waste your time because you won't have the tools to even think about this stuff carefully and so that's why I, I didn't jump in on those questions directly I spent many many years studying artificial intelligence and studying human sensory systems just as technical scientific issues so I could really get a grounding in those in those technical disciplines before then I said okay now you know life is short yeah I, you know you could spend forever getting the technical background but you know you're not going to live forever so at some point you got to transition and, and go after the bigger questions that that motivated me in the first place and so so that's that's what I started to do um, it, that's, that's sort of the background about why I went this way and then I began to go after consciousness itself, right? So what is consciousness? How is it related to our brain activity? And, and we know that there are dozens, perhaps hundreds of very strong correlations between specific kinds of brain activity and specific kinds of conscious experiences. And I'll just give a couple concrete examples to, to fix the idea. There's an area of the brain called area V4, um, visual area four. And there's strong correlation between activity in that area and color experiences. And if you take a very strong magnet, it's, it's something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, and you place it uh, on the skull close to area V4, and for example, set it on an inhibit mode so that you can inhibit activity in area V4. If you do it right, then people will, uh, the, the subject will report that um, if say you did you did V4 in the left hemisphere, they will report that all of a sudden they've lost all color experience in the right visual field. So left hemisphere activity is correlated with right visual field experiences. And when you pull the magnet away, then the color comes seeping back into your visual world. Before you just when, when you have the magnet on, you just see shades of gray. You, you see fine, but you see shades of grain, no color. But when you pull the magnet away, then the color comes back in. And there are dozens of examples like that that are really quite compelling, that there are strong correlations between neural activity and conscious experiences. We, we talk about the various neural correlates of consciousness, or the NCCs. And much of the research that's being done by um, neuroscientists um, in the study of consciousness is the very, very hard work 
of finding and documenting these various NCCs, the neural correlates of consciousness. Very, very important research. But it's well known that correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. And so even though we have these correlations, the, the question is, is it really true that brain activity is causing our conscious experiences or, or that brain activity somehow might be identical to our conscious experiences? And so with the work that I've been doing on evolution and perception, um, well, well, for, first, there, there was there's a, a big problem that's that's come up in in the study. We have all these neural correlates of consciousness, and really good research on that by this, many of my, of my colleagues and friends who, who do this. Very very good work, but it turns out we have no precise mathematical theory, no scientific theory that could explain how brain activity causes specific conscious experiences. There is not a single scientific theory that can say this pattern of brain activity must be the taste of chocolate. It could not be the smell of garlic or the sound of a trumpet. And here's the scientific reason why. And 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 it's quite striking. So we, we have all this data and not a single theory that can predict even or, or explain even one specific conscious experience. And We're this bankrupt. Is, this is the hard problem. This is the so-called hard problem of consciousness. It, it, it's a hard problem because in, in some sense, it's from a physicalist point of view, it's a mystery. No one really has any good idea about how brain activity could, without magic, create conscious experiences. And that's, so there are, there are, you know, and I have many of my friends are involved in this and my colleagues, um, you know, I, I'm, Good friends with Stuart Hameroff, who's got a, a theory about microtubules and um, and how orchestrated collapse of quantum states and microtubules could somehow be related to conscious experiences. But when I'm with him at a conference, I he knows I'm always going to ask, uh, okay, Stuart, can you name a specific conscious experience that you can explain with your you know with your theory that that you can actually say this orchestrated collapse of microtubules must be the taste of a lemon? Can you give me even one? And he can't. And he knows at every conference that I see him, I'm gonna ask the same question because until we can actually start to make specific predictions, we're not doing science yet. So, so there are no scientific theories. Um, there's another theory called integrated information theory. And, and it turns out that um, Giulio Tononi is, is the author of that. And, and there's not a single specific conscious experience for which he can give the, um, a, an integrated information theoretic um, mechanism to, that would be you know, identical to or cause uh, that conscious experience. He, he can't name one. I've, I've asked him personally, and, and there's not a single one that he can name. So we're in a position where we have um, no scientific theories and really no plausible ideas about how brain activity could cause or somehow be uh, conscious experiences. And so now that, that taps back into this work I was talking about on evolution and the predicates of our perception, the language of our perception. I mean, I was saying that uh, if our senses evolved and were shaped by natural selection, the very language of space and time and physical objects, matter, is simply the wrong language to describe objective reality. These are all just symbols. They're all icons or, or data structures, put it that way. Th these are data structures that we use to as an interface with a reality that's not spatial, that's not temporal, um, that that's not composed of physical objects, and so if that's the case, then it's no surprise that if we use the language of physical objects such as neurons, we cannot describe how consciousness arises. We're using simply the wrong language. It's just false that space exists even when it's not perceived. It's false that physical objects like neurons exist when they're not perceived. These are simply icons. These are data structures that we create when we need them and then we garbage collect them as soon as we don't need them. They're data structures that describe fitness payoffs and actions that we can take to obtain fitness payoffs. End of story. There are no insights into objective reality. So if we take a thoroughgoing evolutionary point of view, an apple is just a data structure it, that I create to represent certain fitness payoffs that are 
available to me and certain ways that I could obtain those fitness payoffs, certain actions I could take. So when I look and I see an apple, I'm creating that data structure. And when I look away, I'm garbage collecting that data structure. If I look away and I'm touching it, then I'm filling with my hand a data structure that I'm creating with, with my somatosensory um, sensory system. But that doesn't mean that there was really an apple there even when I'm not looking. It just means that I can make a data structure through either my visual system or my somatosensory system or my auditory system. I'm making these data structures and then I'm garbage collecting them because I have finite memory. So so the idea then, and it's, it's to my colleagues in the neurosciences, this is uh, the stunner. Neurons do not exist when they're not perceived. Therefore, neurons do not have any causal powers. Neurons cause none of our behaviors, none of our conscious experiences, um, none of our sensory experiences. And so from that point of view, it's no surprise that the hard problem of consciousness hasn't been solved and is, and is so hard. We've been assuming that somehow neurons or embodied neurons, I, mean, I have colleagues and friends who are in, into embodied cognition, and, and, and I am too, I think, embodiment. Can you clarify and, embodied cognition? Yeah, the, the idea of embodied cognition is the idea that um, we're not just brains and vats. You know, we, we are real organisms with a real environment around us that we're having to interact with. And somehow it's that process of perception and action and getting feedback of in our perceptual systems of the actions we're taking. There's that closed loop that's, that's really important to our development of our sensory systems. And that, that's sort of the embodied point of view and I, and I think that point of view is 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 quite good but we have to let go of the physicalist side of things and, and the idea is that we you know when we see an apple we're not seeing a truth a pre-existing realm and you know physical objects and we're recovering a true apple we're creating a data structure